Good morning and welcome to the Community Christian Church. Happy Mother's Day, all you moms out there. Appreciate you guys. All right, so if you would, stand and join us while we sing. of Jesus and Nazarene and I wonder how he can love me a sinner condemned unclean come on
failures Bring your addictions Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting God so loved the world When darkness closes in Good morning, 3C. If you want to, go ahead and take your communion cup and uh, get that ready. I know that can be complicated at times. Uh, it's tricky. Um, I don't know about you, but I hate forgetting things. I hate losing things, losing track of things. It's easily frustrating. Uh, keys are the worst. I, I have a spot for my keys and I put them there every time. Uh, but when I don't, uh, I'm flustered and frustrated. Um, when we come to this time, remember is the word Jesus used. Um, and it's, it's not the first time God had used that word. Uh, he oftentimes throughout scripture encourages his people to remember. He uses phrases like, remember this day. Remember this place. Remember what I did for you here. 
And so Jesus just simply continues the, the reminder that God has encouraged throughout history. And that is, remember. Remember how your needs are met. Remember uh, how I delivered you. And remember uh, what I'm about to do, is what Jesus said. And so whenever you do this, and I think it's more than even just Sundays, but especially on Sundays when we gather together as a community of love, we're here because of Jesus. And we're here because of what he's done for us uh, and continues to do. And so uh, as we take this, we remember just how much our God loves us, that he would rather die and die a brutal death than live without us. And so in this moment, we're dedicated to that every week to remember this. Because I don't know about you, but I need reminded uh, more than once a week of what Jesus did for me. Uh, but at least together we could do it once a week, right? And so if you would, uh, if you take the elements as I pray. Lord, we are grateful uh, for your sacrifice. We are grateful for just how much you love us and uh, continue to love us, Lord. You didn't wait for us to get good enough and clean enough to come to you, but you came to us, lived among us, modeled uh, a life, a, a pure life for us, and then died a death that you didn't deserve for us. And so in this moment, Lord, may we remember just how far you went to show us your love. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You want to take the bread and the cup.
the God of the mountain is the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you know there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing and nothing is better than you oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing better than you Lord there's guys um, so I like how Carol Burnett uh, described childbirth uh, it's one of my favorites she said uh, if you want to know what childbirth is like take your bottom lip and pull it over your head <laughs> right and uh, so we're grateful today for mothers Milton Burrell uh, the uh, famous entertainer said, hey, if, if evolution was really true, how come mothers only have two hands? <laughs> because we know that would have progressed to something, there's too much going on there with moms. And he went on to say, uh, we, we all know motherhood is difficult because if it wasn't, fathers would do it. <laughs> Sorry guys, it's just, we gotta pick on each other today, right? Uh, wow. Uh, happy Mother's Day uh, to all of you. I know uh, that this is a day that's not always easy for everyone. Uh, it's, it's not easy for some because of a loss or maybe kind of a broken relationship. And we'll talk a little bit about that today and be, want to be sensitive around that too. But we're also all here because of mothers. And uh, we want to celebrate you and, and the gift uh, that God used you for to, in providing life for us. And and we're going to talk about making life a beautiful thing, the way God originally created it. Uh, but we had some gifts, I think, on your way in, so I hope every, every lady here uh, takes advantage of it. Whether you're a mom or not, we want you to have a little something uh, rec in recognition of how much we love you and are grateful for you to be here. And so thanks for everyone who helped uh, put that together. But many of you know, uh, many of you knew my mother-in-law, Millie Beatley. Jeez, I'm already getting choked up. It's my first Sunday. 
I, you know, I loved Billy. Jeez. Yeah. And so uh, I, I got off to a bit of a rough start. If you'll hear my story in full at some point, I'm sure if you don't know it already, but got a little rough start with the in-laws and, uh, but I think I grew on them eventually. And uh, Millie was always particularly proud of, <laughs> I did not expect this, <laughs> about being in the ministry. And uh, she would always you know, pull me aside and kind of tell me privately that she was proud of me. But, jeez. She said, the advice she always gave to me all the time was, hey, preach Jesus. Just preach Jesus. And uh, I always remember that, those little whispers. I mean, she would say it all the time. Just preach Jesus. Leave all the other stuff behind and just preach Jesus. And so uh, my mom's going to be here later uh, in the next service. Uh, my dad's here this one. Happy Mother's Day, Dad. Uh, <laughs> but the, I couldn't think of a better tribute than to preach Jesus today. As the first message I give here, uh, as, uh, uh, as a tribute to my mother-in-law, who always gave me that pastoral advice, whether I wanted it or not. I know none of your in-laws are like that at all. But uh, I'm just going to preach Jesus today. And I hope that's good with you. I, I am, thank you. I am going to, uh, uh, Frank, if you were here last week or listened in online, welcome everyone online. Um, you heard Frank talk about how much my heart beats for discipleship uh, and disciple making, uh, to be even more clear. And that is because uh, I think that's the mission Jesus gave us. And uh, I think uh, the idea of having the, the gospel message be a part of who we are as well as what we say is such a huge part of being a follower of Jesus. This is what Paul says about this idea in Romans chapter 1 verse 16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone. It is the power of God to bring salvation to everyone. It's, it's not some other strategy. It's not how, how good the preacher is or how good the music is or how good the outreach programs are or whatever. It is the gospel. And we're going to talk about that and because it is the power of God. And this, this is a, the thing I'm going to talk about today is something I use and share all the time. It's, it's something I call a disciple, discipleship tool. It is uh, the story of God or the gospel message. And before I jump into that story of God, and it's, like I said, it's something I use pretty often when somebody asks me, hey, tell me, tell me about this or tell me really what's the big story here. Or, or tell me what you, what you know about Jesus, because my story intersects with his story. This is, this is his story. I'm just, I'm just a part of it. And so what, uh, what I do is try to tell the story of God and weave mine into it. But before we jump into that, I want to talk about gospel fluency. And it may be a new term for you, um, but that's okay. I'm excited to introduce this to you, if it is. Maybe you know it already. But the gospel fluency is, is kind of just like what you would think. Uh, does anybody in here know a different language? Raise your hand if you know a different language. All right, we got a few. Uh, I've been to several different countries across the world, and uh, I know no other languages. So I know what it's like to not speak the language uh, where you're at, but I also know people who can or have. And uh, usually the people who can speak the language aren't what they call fluent in it. It's not smooth. It's not easy. They have to work at it. And the fluency idea is that um, when you speak a different language, it just comes easy. It's simple. And as followers of Jesus, this idea of the gospel should be on the tip of our tongues. And it should be evident in our life. And so I've defined the gospel fluency as the art of being good news, and that's just living a life of good news, winning favor in hearts and people, and sharing good news. And that can come in different forms, but obviously we, need, we intend 
to mean the person of Jesus. Paul defines the gospel as the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So the good news or the gospel is simply Jesus. And so I'm either living out Jesus or I'm able to articulate Jesus. But I do this wherever I am, where I live, where I work, where I play. And it's for the sake of this mission to make disciples. And it's our ability to articulate this. This is why I dub this a tool that I use for disciple making is because I want everyone to be able to tell God's story in a simple way. And sometimes you have to tell a five minute version of that story. And other times you have time to kind of get into it a little bit more and weave your own story as a part of it. But the bottom line is being good news is about investing in people and loving in people and just uh, intentionally interacting with them for the purpose of blessing them. But it's also with a, a keen awareness of who God is drawing to you and bringing your way. I don't know about you, but I found that not everyone likes me, right? I, I know Dave is shocked by that because we've known each other a long time. But the truth is, not everybody likes you either. And God uses people, different people in different ways to attract uh, people to you. And it's those, when Jesus sends out his disciples, he's saying, hey, pay attention to those who are welcoming you and welcoming your message. And this is what I'm paying attention to while I bless everyone. I'm paying attention to who God is drawing to me. And then obviously the sharing good news, which brings us to this message today, this idea of the story of God or the gospel message, is sharing the good news, being able to tell the story of God. Uh, and and it, it's particularly when uh, the strategy about how to tell that story. Some of us could maybe fumble our way through it. Maybe some of us are ready right now. But it's how we tell that that's effective and that communicates well. It's what, it's what we're sharing that's the appropriate content, but it's also the judgment of when to share that in the right moment. And we've seen moments where maybe that's not the right moment to say, you know, to deliver that. But so let's, let's start on, on this idea of the story of God. Um, if you were going to pick one thing in your life that's not as it should be, that's not right, that's not good. Is it, on this Mother's Day, it could be a relationship with a child. It could be a relationship with a parent. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a health condition that you're, you're struggling through and with. Maybe it's a, a, jo a job situation where you're, you're struggling with a coworker or a, a boss or something like that. Pick anything in life. Maybe it's your finances. Whatever is fixed or whatever's not working right now, whatever's not good, Remember that in the beginning, and, and there's two main scriptures I'm going to use today, so I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. There's two main scriptures today. One is Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I know that's kind of a big section of scripture, right? But I want to share this with you because this won't be the only time we, we talk about this. But Genesis 1, 2, and 3 uh, talks about the first two sections, and then uh, 2 Corinthians 5 is going to talk about the next two. So there's four categories all together. The first is creation. And that thing that you thought of that was broken, that thing that you thought of that wasn't right, that thing you thought of that wasn't good, in the beginning, it was. It was made right. I went to the hospital this past week, and I was just reminded that uh, there was a sweet man in that hospital that's not, it's not right that a good, sweet man should suffer, right? But there he was. Uh, trying to figure out what was wrong, and, and uh, it was a great visit and a good time, but the reality is the fact that we need doctors is, is not right. The fact that we need hospitals that just are overflowing with, with patients, the, the fact that we need keys to unlock things because we have to lock them up that in case somebody might try to steal them, that's not right. In the beginning, in Genesis 1 and 2, everything was as it should be. And that's the way God created it. And the thing that you're struggling with right now was made right as well. This was God's 
original plan and everything was as it should be. You had a purpose, you had identity, you had security and the world naturally was as it should be. No evil, no sickness, no death, no doctors, no keys, no locks, nothing. In Genesis 131, and God created all this and it was as it should be. He saw all that he had made and it was very good. But it wasn't just good for God. It was good for us and our identity and purpose. Genesis 2, 25, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. No shame at, at this idea of being naked. And so this perfect world I don't know, I don't want to spoil the end of the story for you, but it didn't last, okay? It didn't last, and so that's what we see in Genesis chapter 3. We see a brokenness that enters into uh, the picture. This good and perfect world that God created gets ruined, and, and God loves us. It, had a great, it has a great plan, but eventually there's a problem. And it's a problem that we all struggle with. It's a problem that the Bible refers to as sin. And in, if you read Genesis chapter 3, it's where sin is introduced to this world and does a lot of damage. Have you ever thought about why sin is such a problem? Why it's such an issue? Uh, why do you think sin is that big a deal? Uh, and the, one of the big problems with sin is that it separates us from God. And we're going to talk about a few more relationships that it separates us from. But it, the biggest one is, is it separates us from God. And the reason that is such a big problem is the Bible says, if, if what the Bible says is true, is that everything good comes from God. And so... Not only are you separated from the person who wants and desires this intimate relationship with you, but everything you know to be good in life is what you're separated from and what you're in danger of being separated from. And so everything that is good comes from him. Being separated from the source of all good things is not good, right? It's not good. And so think about the good things that you have in your life right now. Think of the things that are a tremendous blessing to you. And if that's hard, just think of one good thing that in your li- that's in your life right now. And so if we were separated from God, we are also separated from everything we know to be good and everything that God has designed for us to enjoy and experience and everything that was as it should be um, that was in good and harmony and, and this sin this idea that we have decided to not trust God in his ways gets, breaks these relationships. And it starts with God. But there's four relationships that are broken in Genesis chapter 3. And, and the creation was as it should be. And then the, the separation comes in, in, in Genesis 3. And the, the, the separation breaks these four relationships. One, it's with God. And that's, that's the obvious one. It says this in Genesis 3.10. It says, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid. This is Adam talking. Because I was naked, and so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? So what was a good friendship between Adam and Eve and God is now something we're scared of and we're hiding from. It says in Genesis 2 that we were naked and unashamed. And now all of a sudden, we are naked and ashamed. Ashamed of the guilt. And ashamed in fear of the relationship and the power of that intimacy is now kind of perverted. The second relationship that we see that is broken in, in, in this sin impact is with others. I don't know if any of you have any struggles with others in a broken relationship, but in Genesis uh, two or 3, 12 and 13, says, the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And then the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. What was like this harmonious, solid, good friendship relationship that they had is now turned into finger pointing. 
Well, she made me do it. He, he's the one that did it. You know, it's this back and forth. Have you guys sensed any kind of tension between relationships in our world today? I mean, is any, I don't know if you guys still feel the impact of this one moment here. Uh, is there any finger pointing going on in our world today? Is there any struggle with relationships and maybe putting ourselves in other shoes and seeing it from their perspective? Or maybe being able to sit down with somebody who disagrees with us without hating them or pointing fingers at them because it's their fault and not ours? We don't see that today. It's a good thing we got those things cleared up so far. But uh, this is what happened in Genesis chapter 3. It's what happens is what we struggle with today. The third relationship that is broken in Genesis chapter 3, we see in verse 17 and, and beyond, it is with the world. So it's with God, it's with others, and it's with the physical world. Verse 17 says, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat from it all the days of your life. He goes on to talk about painful childbirth and other things that will get in the way to make things hard. Our, our work, we had work before sin entered the picture, but it was fulfilling. It was meaningful. It, it gave us purpose. But now, while we still have, uh, ident- we still have an identity in a job, that he gave us to do, it is now made so much more difficult. The world is broken. We see natural disasters. We see diseases. And we see all kinds of battles with the physical world that cause us pain. And so there's the separation with God, the separation with others, the separation with the world, and the, and the last, and the brokenness. And I think this is one we don't usually pick up on. And that is with ourselves. With ourselves. See, in the beginning, in Genesis 1 and 2, when it was as it should be, our identity and purpose was secure in him. Our identity and purpose was as it should be. We had work to do. We had a job to do to represent him, to work and and rule the world. And it was going to be fulfilling and purposeful. And we had a secure moment, so secure We walked around naked. I don't want to give any visuals there. But we were that secure that we just roamed naked. I mean, think of it. This is true. This is in the Bible. This is not Mike Toll talking. This, that's how secure and how harmonious our relationship with God, with others, with the world, and with our self was. And this is what sin breaks. We were naked and unashamed and now we're naked and ashamed they realized they were naked so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves god is the source of everything that is good and sin breaks all those good things perverts all those good things and separates us from all those good things that's why heaven and hell is talked about in such extreme language because Heaven is where God is and everything that is good. And hell is where God isn't and is the absent of everything that is good. And this presents a problem for God. Because once we get associated with sin, we have this condition that God and his nature of justice needs to deal with. But also in his compassion and love for his children and his people and his creation wants to fix and love and embrace. So theologians call this, this idea of sin, that the people that he loves is full of the thing he can't be associated with, sin. Theologians call this a problem fit for God. How does God fix this problem? How how can he reconcile his beloved creation and children back to him when they're full of sin? It's against his very nature. And so sin separates us from this God that is loving. It, it, It breaks our close relationship with him, but not just with him, with everything that's good. With our friendships, our relationships, our marriages, 
our, our, our kids, our parents, all these things with the world, our jobs, our work. Nobody has any trouble at work anymore, right? Or earning a living anymore. Everybody, you know, this sort of thing. Nobody has any trouble with diseases or health and this sort of thing. No, this is the kind of world that God of sin broke and broke from the way it was supposed to be. And we've spent so much time trying to get back to a relationship with God that's right. And we, sometimes we just run from him. And then other times we try to fix it ourselves. And in many ways that started in you know, the Old Testament with 613 laws. We were trying to, to get those right. How many of you think you've kept all three, 613 Old Testament laws? Anybody close? Anybody? <laughs> okay, half. How many of you got half of them down? All right. I can tell you that there's a big chunk of them you can't observe simply by proximity. You can't be in Jerusalem right now. So it, it is a big little stumbling block for you all, but even half of them. Okay, so then I feel like God kind of narrowed it down. So I'll tell you what, I'll give you a top 10 list. I'll give you a top 10 list. Then you guys will get it down, right? I'll give you a top 10 list. Then you'll have it figured out. Then you can obey those. How many you got the 10 down? Right. Anybody got the top 10 down? How about half of the top 10 down? Anybody got that right? Hey, what if I offered you six commandments and four do the best you can? Would that be all right? Would that be okay? You, you, you get that, right? Okay, then God, then Jesus shows up to the scene. He says, I'll, give, I'll tell you what. This is what I'm going to do. 613 didn't cut it. 10 didn't cut it. How about I narrow it down to two? Then they'll get it, right? Then they'll, then they'll get it taken care of. All I need you to do is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor uh, as yourself. Okay, you guys, go ahead. And we got that down pat, right? No, we don't have that down pat either. And so as much as God is generous and gracious with us, uh, James says, whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking them all. It's because a one just separates us and God. And so this is the problem fit for God. And the reason it's a problem fit for God is because only he can solve it. it it's, not a, it's not rules we can keep. It, it's not a formula we can obey. It's not a thing at all. It's actually a person. And that brings us, so if you're following along, and I'll summarize in the end here, and we'll talk about this again at some point, but we have, in the beginning, creation. We have the separation. And then what we have, third, is a reconciliation. And this moves us from Genesis 1, 2, and 3 to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. God's answer is not an action we can do. It's not a sacrifice we can make. It's not a rule we can obey. It's, it's not a thing at all. It's a person. And earlier, we, we kind of referred to this idea that it, because of God's just nature of having to deal with sin, but also his love and compassion for us, that theologians call this a problem fit for God. And here's why it's a problem. Here are the things that, that were necessary for this sacrifice and I don't know where we come up with this, but how do we find somebody who, who's human, who's innocent? We got any of those? Human, innocent, and eternal, because this sacrifice can't just, if it was human and innocent, that's great, but honestly, that's only good for one for one. But if they're eternal, they can operate and offer this sacrifice again and again and again. And so who can possibly fulfill those requirements? There's only one answer to that, and that is God himself. But God isn't human. But what if he became human? And so that's what happens. This is the story of Jesus, that our God loves us so much that he was willing not only to come, just think about the sacrifice in and of itself from going from being God on high to an embryo in Mary's womb. That alone is a sacrifice. To give up all the powers that you would have to for a while so that you can become an embryo in a limited human form 
that is totally dependent on others, and then growing as a young man into a, a grown man, and then sacrificing. Second Corinthians 5 says this, all of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. See, Jesus came to live a life without sin, a life that he didn't deserve the punishment for sin, but he lived a life that we can model. But he also died a sacrifice that he didn't deserve. And Jesus' death paid the price uh, for all, all sin and therefore removed this barrier that was separating us from God and was able to reconcile us and reunite us with him. This is why Jesus is the focus of our love and our worship and our devotion. Amen? This is why. And there are all kinds of scriptures that we can talk about uh, that God demonstrates his own love in this, that he, uh, while we were sinners, Christ died for us, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We could go on, John 3, 16, and others, but Jesus came to reconcile our relationship with God back to the way it was meant to be originally. And who does God want to see saved from their sin? Everyone. No matter who you are and what you've done, listen to this line again on, and from this scripture in 2 Corinthians 5. It says this, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Jesus not only came to sacrifice himself for our forgiveness, for our salvation, he came to live a life that we could model. That he came to not just restore our relationship with God, but all of our relationships that were broken in Genesis 3. Jesus is not only the focus of our love and worship, he is the example and the motive for our purpose and our mission. And that brings me to the last category. We, had, we have the creation, we have the separation, we have the reconciliation, and then the last, the fourth, is invitation. Because of this great news that God has given us, this grace and, and through Jesus' sacrifice, we're now, if we really embrace that, uh, we really should be able to be motivated. If we believe that Jesus went that far for us, we now should be motivated to kind of let people in on the secret, right? We're quick to tell other people about good news when it comes to hey, uh, you need a refrigerator? There's refrigerators on sale at Best Buy or something like that. We're quick to tell somebody, oh, you need a new cell phone? Verizon's having a new good deal, right? We're quick to do that because it's an act of friendship to tell somebody else something they need and that there's a good deal on. We're quick to say, hey, so-and-so's got this for sale because it is an act of friendship, an act of generosity to share that good news. And if we believe this message of Jesus, it is the same for us. In that we have been, but listen to the way Paul describes this in the invitation. Because we've now broken, Jesus has brought this thing back, and, but he's invited us to be, to be the ministry, be about the ministry of reconciliation. So 2 Corinthians 5 says this, that in all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Let me repeat that. He gave us now the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. An ambassador for Christ is what we are. You know what an ambassador is, don't you? It's a representative of one kingdom to another. We are God's representatives. We are kingdom of heaven representatives. We are representing the king. Is, and we'll talk a lot more about that next week. 
But the truth of the matter is we are ambassadors for Christ and our ministry and our job, every single one of us, is the ministry of reconciliation. It is to restore these four broken relationships that occur in Genesis chapter 3, starting with the relationship with God, but also with each other, with the world, and with ourselves. That this idea is that we are ministers of reconciliation to all that was broken and to be restored back to the way God originally created it to be because he is working to bring it back to the way it was originally created to be and it will happen. And so we're just waiting. This past year has been, been tough and, and we've all endured some kind of uh, example of a broken relationship um, in, in 2020. We, we've had all kinds of issues that reminds us that this place is not as it should be, that things aren't right. I mean, we've seen uh, examples of separation and isolation from people that we love dearly and been forced upon us. We've seen loved ones and, and brothers and sisters experience job loss. And businesses close down and struggle through uh, hard times. We've seen, if you're a parent at all, you know you've experienced educational challenges where they've been forced to happen at home and work maybe hasn't even stopped and you've got to orchestrate some kind of uh, lesson plan for the kids or make sure that that happens. And some kids aren't equipped with tools to make that happen at home. And we've seen the struggle of all of that happen. We've seen, obviously, and it continues, social tensions and injustice happen. Things that cause the broken relationship with, between each other to flare up. We've seen struggle with mental health issues and depression and anxiety, which has rapidly increased over this past year. And then we have this season that we're kind of in and where this, our society's hope is in a vaccine and, and, and getting shots and, and making things uh, hopefully back to normal a little bit. No matter where your position on that is, there's, this world puts a lot of hope in, in this thing. And I don't know, I don't know how many of you are around 100 years ago. Anybody around 100 years ago? But, you know, we had this uh, little, fray, little, little uh, season called the Roaring Twenties. And boy, I hope that we experience that in 2020s. That we have this surge of this as after they recovered from the Spanish flu, that there was this just kind of this optimism and hope and think and just celebration. But I'm telling you, none of that is where we find our hope. It's Jesus. That's it. And we got a world who needs a big heaping dose of hope. We got people who have a broken relationship with God and, and do not think that our God loves them and is not sure that they'd be worthy to even step in a place like this, let alone have a God die for them. We got, we got broken relationships uh, across our world and community that flares up in all kinds of different tensions, but sometimes we even have broken relationships among us that's supposed to be this community of love. We have, we have certainly have toil and stress with the world in general that, that it suffers, but then we also have this identity crisis for ourselves. And so our hope is not in some vaccine. It's not in some economy bounce back. It's not in any of those things. It's not in our political positions or our bank accounts. It's not in a thing at all. It's in a person. And I hope that we can get used to this gospel fluency of talking about this person with ease and with great sense of good news. That we're not just talking good news, but we are good news. That we're ambassadors of good news. That we are helping God use us to restore this world back to the way it was meant to be. If you would pray with me. God, thank you.
Thank you for the honor of being titled uh, your ambassador. Thank you for uh, the opportunity um, to represent you. God, we pray that we will represent you well. It's easy and quick to see just how much is broken in our world. But God, we are called by you to be little slices of heaven. And so maybe as we go from this place on this rainy day, as we celebrate mothers, maybe, may we be slices of heaven. May what happens in ha- heaven happen in Bethel, in the surrounding community. May your will be done in Bethel as it is in heaven. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Go out there and be good news and share good news uh, where we live, work, and play. God bless you.